All right. Well, can you put your right hand over your heart and raise your left hand to heaven? Close your eyes and join me. We're going to continue to give glory to God because uh, I, I sometimes use this little light of mine too. That's a wonderful one. And, uh, but this one too, I'm going to sing it in a relatively low key, the very end of How Great Thou Art. Close your eyes. Let's give God this glory. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Take it to the end. How great thou art. How great thou art. Give God a hand clap. <laughs> now can everybody stand up for a minute? I'm a grandma, and prayerfully soon I'll be a great grandma because uh, my oldest, no, next to my oldest grandson is engaged to be married. So uh, they're going to start that road. So it will be maybe a year or two or something like that. But I learned this when uh, some of my little grandbabies were being born. And if you're a grandparent, you're going to tell your age because you're going to do this with me. If not, just try. It goes like this. Sing with me. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Now give God a hand clap as you take your seats. Only because we can still do that. So go ahead and take your seats. And so as, as uh, Reverend Berg was t singing and bringing us into that, mom says we can, you know, we may not all be able to talk together. My mom, Naomi King, but we can all sing together. And that is something we can do. And uh, when we were young, you might have known red and yellow, black and white. All the precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Well, the scripture that goes to that, this is kind of March for Life Week. And then you've got Martin Luther King holiday. He would have been 90 years old. Isn't that amazing? And uh, so one of the main scriptures that I grew up with was of one blood. God made the human race, you know, created of one blood. God created man, you know, to live together on the face of the earth. Acts 17, 26. So we fight over race, we fight over politics, we fight over who likes coffee and who likes tea, you know, but one blood. And that way, if we're one blood, and this is a lesson first to the church because we have to show it, and I don't mean a church denomination, I mean, you know, people who love God and love Jesus. And so if we can do that, and we can demonstrate that. Because Martin Luther King Jr. really did say, we must learn to live together as brothers. And I had his sisters. I said, well, were there any women in the Bible? Daddy, granddaddy, uncle, and man, why is it always man, man, man? But God made man, male, and female. So we can't even really fight over that. And so we're one blood. Because he would say, we must learn to live together as brothers. I had his sisters. Or perish together as fools. Well, if, if you're different races, you can't even be brothers. You know, so we could go with the Bible and the real theologians are here. I'm an evangelist, but they're ones who can really teach this. So the spirit shows that we are one human race. But biology and science show that. And that's the thing about it. Science really confirms the word of God. So we have to kind of know that and walk in it. But uh, also, it's, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But faith works by what? The illusions. Love. Love. Faith works by love. So that is where we are here. And in this particular conference, with all the speakers, and I did ask a look at the program. I was kind of going through it when Georgette, I'm going to tell you all about Georgette and me. She, she did you the nice version. I'm going to tell you all about it. I'm telling everything. Georgette, don't get mad. But <laughs> mobilizing the church for life from the womb to the tomb. And so that's every aspect. And we're fighting right now over a wall and who can come across the border, but we're keeping little babies from coming past the border of the womb. You see? So we have to get our perspectives together. But I did kind of want to share 
Georgette was right, because Georgette is genuinely like a sister to me, for real. And I had to make some decisions earlier in this century, at the turn of the century, and one of them was whether or not I would shift in many, many ways. I became a born-again Christian in 1983, and I agreed to serve God, and I began to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and many things have been added to me, including long life, the long life of Psalm 91. Uh, 68th birthday is Tuesday. And uh, I'm just so excited. I'm just glad. And I'll be at home for a change because Georgia has seen my tears through the years. On my birthday, January 22nd, every year, most of the time, I'm out there marching and fighting. So there was no cake, no candles, no hugs from the family, you see. This year, I actually will be at home. Isn't that amazing? So that's something. And I'm excited about that. But Georgia and I had these many conversations and I want to remember one particular night. I think we were in your room. Jennifer O'Neill was there. We had on pajamas, and we began to give our own testimonies. That's the first time I ever heard George's testimony. And they heard more of mine, which has continued to unfold, because I used to say I had an abortion, then I said I had two, and then I said I had a miscarriage related to it. And the kids say, well, which one is true? I say, guys, just peel the onion. Peel that onion. And Georgette has helped me to do that all the way through. I've known Georgette when she had the short bob, the long hair. <laughs> She's known me when I had all the colors with no gray, and then I let all the gray come out, and everybody says, oh, we're, not, we're not sure if we like that, so I put some ginger back in with the gray. <laughs> See, that, that's, that's, that's the sister's talk. <laughs> and we have had many, many tears. I celebrate Georgette. Uh, I do want to mention this. We talk about triggers a little bit. I'm post-abortive, and my mom wanted to abort me in 1950 when abortion was illegal. So she wanted a DNC, and, and the Birth Control League, which was becoming Planned Parenthood, was promoting this procedure for mysterious female ailments. Because you couldn't get an abortion. It was illegal. But you could go get this little DNC thing, and anything that made you have a tummy question was no longer a question. And so mom wanted to do that. And my granddaddy, Martin Luther King Sr., said, Naomi, Nene, it was her nickname, they're lying to you. That's not a lump of flesh. That's my granddaughter. I saw her in a dream three years ago. She has bright skin and bright red hair, and she's going to bless everybody. And it was true. I was born looking just like he said. So I shared that with George Ed and the girls, and uh, we began to march together and it's been years through the years, and uh, so it's just a joyous occasion. How could I say no when George A. called? Just not possible. So I give God, can we give God the glory? Amen. So uh, George A. also has encouraged me about my weight and stuff. I finally lost a little bit. Need to lose a lot more. And uh, so just a big sister, little sister. I think I'm, I, you know, but uh, we're there. And so I did kind of want to mention, because we're moving into Martin Luther King week, uh, to put the question to rest, and I'll be taking a few questions at the end, was Martin Luther King Jr. pro-life? Well, of course he was, but that language did not exist during his lifetime. Abortion was illegal during the lifetime of Martin Luther King Jr. His wife, not him, went to uh, a ceremony to accept an award which he did not accept. It's called the Maggie Award, the Margaret Sanger Award. Yeah, yeah. so they, Margaret Sanger really said, colored people are like weeds, they need to be exterminated, but we don't want that word to get out. So we need, let's cultivate their people, their best and brightest. Let's give awards and scholarships and grants and recognition. See, abortion was illegal, so they didn't say, let's, let's do abortion, no, 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 no. So they offered him, but he, interestingly enough, he says, no, that's not something I need to attend. That's something the women need to look into that. And see, this is a problem I'm approaching. For a long time, that's the problem we had in the church. And the problem was, let the women handle it. And so with that kind of thing, that was Martin Luther King's mindset. But remember, abortion wasn't discussed. Guess what birth control was? Natural family planning, which he actually supported. They didn't call it that. Back then, they called it the rhythm method. So, you know, churches and everybody says, well, yeah, just do the rhythm method. Well, guess how sophisticated that has become today? 
Just like you can walk somewhere and buy a pregnancy test, you could go to the dollar store for a dollar and get an ovulation test. But science wasn't explaining all of that. So that's the world of Martin Luther King regarding life. So his wife went to the ceremony. She read the speech that someone else had written. And the speech, speech sounded so different from anything Martin Luther King Jr. ever preached, wrote, or said, that it was very obvious that that wasn't his speech. She was reading it. And so what we've had for the pastors and, and leaders of the church, especially the men, is, oh, that's something women need to handle. And, and the compassionate men, the leaders of the Christian denominations and Jewish and all the people of faith, we don't want to hurt the women's feelings. So let's not talk about that. And if we do talk about it, let the women talk about it in secret. And the secrets were killing us. I, I, it's so funny. George, can you stand behind that pole there so I don't keep looking at you and want to cry? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> come back out. Come out. But... I just keep wanting, can you come up here? Come up here, Georgette, and hold my hand, really, because this is, for some reason, I'm triggering. She could tell you about that another time. But when I do these kinds of things, it just takes me back to other places. I really, I'm triggering, for real, I'm not kidding. Triggering means that we might start crying when we're talking. <laughs> we might need a hug when we're talking. So here I am, rescued by Daddy King from abortion, Tricked by Planned Parenthood years later, Martin Luther King didn't even write the speech, didn't read it, didn't go to the event. His wife did it, but they tried to attach my uncle's name to the issue of abortion. I couldn't take it. And I would say, Judge, they yell, they're still trying. So these are, these are things we have to deal with. And then these bold ladies, we have to go out and tell our testimony. Do y'all know that's not fun? Is it fun, Judge? No the hardest part? It's the hardest part. And most of the times you remember when you do it. But we do it anyway. So give God the glory one more time. Georgia. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, I'm okay. So when I think about that, and I say, God, it, and it doesn't necessarily get easier, but it's very necessary. So when you ask why we do it, because every time we do it, at the end of the talk, it'll probably happen today, just quietly. Somebody will come and hold my hand. I'm your sister. I'm your brother. I've been through that. Or I know somebody who's been through that. Thank you. Can we pray? So it's worth it. And so I, I just thought it was very, very important to share that. I am the executive producer of a film called Roe v. Wade. It's a movie. They did one in 1989 but they tried to make it a hero movie and to show how great abortion was. This is the remake. This is the one that really tells how Roe v. Wade, be Wade became law. So I'm under attack now. Facebook's book keeps taking down our ads or doing all kinds of stuff, and we're right in the middle of that now. But, and, and, and the question, the, the reverend said, and, and I made a note here. He said, your testimony we are those who overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Each person in this room has a testimony. Would you mind just saying, if you can, say, I have a testimony. Yes. We all have a testimony. And there are ways to share that testimony right here within this group. Make sure that you read, fill out, pay attention to everything, including all the speakers. But this summit evaluation and feedback form. It's going to be very important. This follow Anglicans for Life on social media. And if y'all don't like social media, it's okay. It's not the devil. Sometimes the people who do it use it for good or for bad. But the technology in and of itself is not the devil. But what I'm discovering, if I spend too much time on it, especially there's a lot of bad language sometimes and all this, the next thing I know, I'm just about to say one of those things too. So I can't do too much time on it, but I do it. And the, and the millennials, my daughter gave me, and, and I've got some notes on here, and that's why I asked for it back. She gave me my first iPhone when she became a school teacher years ago now. She's married now and has little girls and all that. She said, if you don't learn how to text, you'll never speak to me again. <laughs> and my pastor now, my pastor Alan McNair, you'll hear about him in all my books and talks and all of that. But Pastor McNair um, 
would call, he'd be preaching, and he says, what's that thing over there? Bring it up here and see. Doesn't it have the Bible in several versions? Would you look it up in such and such version and read that? Because the members, what is wrong with her? She's disrespecting God. She has a phone in church. That is a problem. But now the new pastor, he'll say, raise your Bible, electronic or paper. This is my Bible. So all of this tech technology is important. Use it or not. I, I don't have a judgment on that. But please don't judge the technology. But help out, because I, I see here, and the only reason I mentioned that, um, trying to see, can they reach you on all of these? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. I don't really even use Pinterest. It's because the thing's getting so big, it's not, there's only so much any of us can do. But please stay connected. So the triggers, those of us who've been through the experiences, the leaders, and you're all leaders, you, are, you have influence, you have a voice, and you have a testimony, we're going to have to be prepared and ready Especially when the young people, at the March for Life, uh, we went to hmm, 2003 or so. I can't remember which year it was. But I remarked on that. Wow, there are a lot of kids here. And every year there are more and more. Because that's the thing about it. We keep growing with our kids because we don't abort the kids. I mean, it's almost a no-brainer. Where are the kids coming from? They're being born. <laughs> no-brainer. So we march, and we march, and we march. Now, I have another thing, and I am not going to show that today, and it's called a model. It's a three-headed monster, because I also like science fiction and Star Trek and all that, and I like uh, mythology, which is not totally mythology. It's really, if you read the Bible, there were giants in the land, there were Nephilims in the land. And, you know, for all of us, okay, have you ever gone to a movie? And I looked at a, one, this on the plane called Peppermint with Jennifer Gardner, and she killed a whole lot of people. And uh, they were bad people. They were evil people, but she did. And so I used to watch that, and people say, nobody can do that. Not one man can't take out 20 or 100 or 1,000, but David and his mighty men, if you really read the Bible, any one of them by himself could take out hundreds. One man. So it is possible. We don't do it, though. This is not how we fight our battles. Y'all ever heard that song? This is how I fight my battles. Anybody ever heard that? Okay, some of us. So the way we fight our battles is we, we fight them on our knees and we get up and we act. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty to pulling down strongholds. And Ephesians 6 gives you a picture, and that's not the full armor. That's the full armor, but then you've got garments of praise and various other spiritual uh, weapons and clothes. The kids laugh. Judge, it. I, I still have a little leather. Now it's pleather, which is crazy, because they're going to charge you as much for leather, for, for fake leather, because of human caring for the, the animals, and we should. So they charge all this money for something called pleather. But when the kids see me at pleather, they say, oh, Lord, she's going to war. <laughs> I come out of the prayer room. I put on my leather skirt or my leather jacket or whatever. Oh, Lord, she's going to war today. So the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth, the sandals of the gospel of peace, and the shield of faith. Without faith, it really is impossible to please God. And yet faith works by love. So you need to be dressed like that every day, spiritually. Because we're getting hits, hits like crazy, but we win, we win, and we march, and we pray, and we come to meetings, and we share what God has given us to give to the community, and as we continue to do that, guess what? We grow. We actually grow. How long is this particular meeting? Is it annual? This is our fourth one. How many people came to the very first one? Okay, so each year, each year, she's filling rooms. She's filling, who else had something else to do to, instead of being here today? <laughs> we all did, but we are here. We grow. And each of you, with your testimony, with your voice, with your circle of influence, represents thousands and thousands. Don't ever underestimate that. But humility is so important, because who gets the credit? God. Who gets the glory? God. Who gets the blessings? You see? <laughs> The blessings are so much better. We, we're not equipped for glory. That's why all the movie stars and the athletes and all that drunk, taking pills and doing things and having to go to just all kinds of things for relief because they're trying to take glory. 
I need to reverse that and learn how to be blessed. And then that's where the success comes from. And uh, I did have to get help getting up on the platform. I'm riding wheelchairs in the uh, airport. People say, you okay? I broke my foot in March last year. It's pretty much okay, but I can still feel it. So trying to go through airports a lot and uh, coming up and down, I want to be very sure-footed. I just have to be. So that's what's happening. I was 316 pounds. I'm a lot less and need to be a lot less, sir. And I'm working on that, so pray for me. But we have to be equipped because guess what? This is what we walk around in this planet in. So we need to do something about that too. So if you're not getting enough sleep, enough rest, if you're not eating properly, please do so. I, I won't charge you for that one. Just, just do it. <laughs> You'll feel better and you'll be more useful, useful. Now, abortion, but not just abortion, the three-headed monster. I was getting ready to tell you about where fact and fantasy meet. Uh, in the, actually, in the Bible, I don't know which characters or creatures they call them, but a, a hydra is a monster with several heads. And the only way to kill a hydra is to chop off all the heads at once and stab it through the heart. So we do that in this manner. I have a model called Three-Headed Monster. You can look up Alveda King, Three-Headed Monster. And when you look that up, you'll see this beast. And it's in some, it appears in some of my books and things. So racism, okay? The racist says, okay, God said, this is the commandment, be fruitful and multiply. Okay, God, I'll be fruitful and multiply, but they have to look like me, sound like me, live on my block, all that, or I'm not having it. I'll abort it or fix it so I don't get a baby or something. Okay, so no, I'm not doing that. And then reproductive genocide. I might produce, I might not. And if I don't want to, I won't. And if I get pregnant, I still won't. And then sexual perversion. Well, we might do it, but we're going to make sure that anything that is born is not going to grow up to glorify you, God. So that's that little three-headed monster, the hydra. So we do. How do you do it? In your armor with truth. And you go and help, rescue, and save every victim of any of that that you can. The book of Jews says, snatch them out of fire, hating the stench on the garment. The garment, remember, under these things is the earth suit, our body. So we can see all that stuff, but what is God after? Souls. God is after souls. And so must we be. And so when people say all kind of ugly things, uh, Jesus said, pray for those who say all mad of things, mad of things against you. And they do. Judge, and I went to try, and it, and it did hurt me for a while. I went to get my nails done last year. And so I'm sitting up there, and a lady in the other chair begins to curse me out about the president. How can you smile and stand next to him? I was like, God, 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 what am I going to say? Can I punch a guy? Can I play side? Oh. <laughs> so I said, ma'am, thank you for sharing your opinion with me today. God bless you. And I got out of that nail shop as fast as I could. <laughs> and I didn't go get my nails or anything done for a while because I was like, where can I go? Because I'm on TV and I'm here and there all the time and people know me. And they think it's okay to come up and say whatever they want to say. But I couldn't hate her. That's the thing. I had still love her. Ma'am, thank you for sharing your opinion. And I was genuine. I wasn't kidding because I had prayed and I asked God how to do that. And he says, you know, my ways really are not your ways. So, no, you don't do anything to her. Just bless her and move. <laughs> That's real hard. That is not easy. But it is possible and we can do that. So, uh, Every time, usually when I see uh, Georgette, but I did today, just held her hand and leaned on her in public today. But we just get a hug, a little gleam in our eye and a smile. It means so much. It does. So I'm saying all that to say we take the hydras down, but we can't see that they're connected. Even like the argument over the wall, why do we need a wall, this, that, and the other? Well, the question becomes this. My goddaughter, Angela Stanton King, who works with me on prison reform, criminal justice reform, she says, well, if you don't believe it, just take your door off your house, set it to the side, leave the door open. Anybody coming down the street? Hello, come on in. They're all going to be so nice to you. You know, so it's not even practical. Security makes sense. You care for everybody, the least of these, as my granddaddy would say, but with some order and some sanity. 
The last time I looked, somebody, a prophet, called me the other day. He said, there's a scripture. Upon this rock, I'll build my church to reveal revelation that Jesus is the Son of God. Simon Peter revealed that. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail. So hell has gates. Heaven has gates. Gates really are connected to walls. It's just a no-brainer. It just makes no sense. Oh, Lord. So I was going to connect the Hydra with that. Sex trafficking. And the girls get pregnant. What do you think they do? Drag them over to Planned Parenthood. Abort the babies and throw them back out there into the wolves. It's connected. A lot of it is racism. Let's have an Aryan, perfect Aryan race. But as I look out here, everybody, y'all would have been on the hit list too. Y'all wouldn't make it just because your skin is fair. Because they didn't like anybody. It was a very elite list. So we are human. We are one blood. Of one blood, God made all people to live together on the face of the earth and then appointed us where God wanted us. But another scripture that, that uh, is looked over there, it says God and he placed them, the lonely, in families. So the connection of the family, that's us, maybe 27 or 28, but it's in that last, at the, at, so it's the bottom of the passage. So family is so important. Family's been ripped apart by so many things. But people keep fighting back for family. All of us do in different ways. So f conception, fertilization, and then when the baby's born, and the baby has to be a child and be nurtured, grow older, and then transist naturally. So all of that. That's, that's the real sanctity of life. So I tell people all the time, especially in my community, I can't just, don't abort your baby, that's a sin. Of course it is. Don't abort your baby, that's a crime against humanity. Yes, it is. But people in my community, and probably in many of yours too, well, once the baby's born, if you can't afford the baby, or if you can't this, or somebody's going to beat you up if you have the baby. I mean, all the reasons come. But Mother Teresa, and I really don't have that quote here, today, but Father Pavone, Pavone says it well, too, over at Priest for Life, where I'm director of civil rights for the unborn. Uh, we have to find, a, and this is co quoting both of them, kind of putting it together, but there has to be a way of serving the public without killing the public. There has to be a way, and there is. There are many ways. And so that's what's all here, too. So you may be serving the elderly. You may be serving the poor. You may be serving the youth. You may be serving the pregnant families. All of that. There are more pregnancy care centers in America than abortion mills now. Today, yeah. But it wasn't always, you see? So we really are winning. That's two, two barometers. How many pregnancy care centers are there and how many young people attend the march? That's what you can see. And uh, just because I'm looking out over this, if you're under 40, can you stand up? I'm still standing up, but I'm faking, okay? <laughs> if you're under 40, please stand up. You see? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Back there on, on the computers, too. See? So this is important. We got to know this. And we have to know how to share cooperatively the responsibilities, the work, learn from the young. And young, you have to learn from us, too. There's something. We coexist in this time. We breathe the same air. So we actually have to work together. Abortion is a crime against humanity, but so is human trafficking, so is racism, and on and on and on. So we tackle it, and it comes down. Now, this is the part, because I'm going to sh show a video in a minute and then take questions, but uh, somebody asked the other day, would I like to do a column? And I do write a few columns and things like that, and I kind of do want to do that. So the questions, these are the questions that there, and it won't come out. I'll do it, submit it in February, and I'm not sure when it'll be printed, but these are the questions. What is the Holy Spirit saying right now to believers? What issues is the church facing? How is the Spirit leading the church to react to those issues? I'm going to flip. That's the third question. Please respond, not react. Respond. The church must do that with answers, with truth, with examples. The church has to respond. The church has just been 
quiet too long. And, you know, whether a baby should live or die, that's not political. The Bible says choose life. That's not political. So those many of the issues, people are hungry and starving and going around stealing a loaf of bread because they're hungry. That's, that is immoral. They shouldn't have to do that. But why are they so hungry that they feel like they have to steal the bread in the first place? Don't you have enough bread in the house of God to share? Oh, this is a little harder. I didn't mean to go here. I, I'm not kidding. I really didn't. Oh, but I'm, wow. Mom and daddy in the church sitting up there and the, the child is doing something or sneaks and tries to do a phone or something and you look at your neighbor apologize. I don't know where they get that from. <laughs> it begins in the home, at the house. But what happened now, not jumping on anybody because I've had those challenges myself. I remember I was in the choirs years ago and my son who's in medical school right now, but he was little. And uh, they could never find their shoes or their socks when it was time to go to church. Please tell the truth if that ever happened to anybody other than me. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Did that really, honestly? So this particular day, I said, I don't care. You're putting something on your feet. We are going to church. Okay, okay. Everybody gets in the car. I'm not paying attention. So I'm up on the choir, and I'm singing, I worship thee, you almighty. We're singing. And then I see this little head bobbing across the back of the sanctuary. My son, the shoes he found were roller skates. <laughs> and he skated all around the back of the sanctuary. I jump off the platform, go drag him out the back. How in the world? Well, you said put something on our feet, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, so parenting is a very responsible thing. And, and often, unfortunately, what happened to the boomers, everybody went out to work, finally. Dad first was the breadwinner, then mom went out. And then the TV, if you couldn't afford nannies and stuff, began to raise your children. And they got some stuff that we are still trying to recover from. So family is important. Well, how many? I see that. Show me again. I'm sorry. I didn't look up. Okay. Is that including questions and answers? Okay. All right. Well, okay. What I want to do, I, I could go on and on with these things, but what we do, uh, the church must respond. The issues, we know what they are. We've just been talking about all of them today. And now, not only respond, but be a leader. Share your testimony. Let's show that video, and then I'll be ready to answer questions. In my fear, I believed a lie all those years. I was trying to hide away, ashamed of the light of day. Made a choice. Thinking I'd be free, but that choice it imprisoned me in my shame till I stepped into the light of God's life, the healing began. 